On the Tape is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity, iConnections, reimagining how the investment industry connects, and SoFi, get your money right all in one app. Welcome to the Monday edition of the On the Tape podcast. I am Dan Nathan. I am with EY from SoFi. That would be Liz Young. Liz, welcome. Hello. Happy tax day. Ha- oh, happy death and taxes, baby. <laughs> um, it felt like death in the markets last week. We're bouncing um, a little bit this week. We're going to talk a-, a little bit about that action and, and-, and why we probably had the worst week of the year uh, for the S&P 500, down 1.6%. But as we are recording this pre-opening on Monday, we're up about 80 basis points in the S&P 500, getting a bunch of that back. Uh, the geopolitics playing a big role, I think, in the fear late last week. A little calmer heads may be prevailing um, this Monday morning. We're going to talk about a whole heck of a lot of things on the single stock front. We're going to talk about earnings. We're going to talk about a lot of Fed speak. Um, and we're also going to speak with, I actually spoke with Chris Verone. He is partner and head of technical analysis, including macro research at Strategus. And we had a great conversation. I've known Chris for a long time, as has Liz um, from our programs on CNBC uh, and the like. We talked about the evolution of technical analysis, how uh, you know institutions use technical analysis versus, let's say, some of the home gamers, um, if you will, uh, and a whole host of other macro stuff. So a great conversation with Chris. So stick around, Liz. You know Chris. You've known him from the shows. You've known him personally. Um, really interesting set of skills in that man. Yeah, I, I mean, I saw Chris last week, I think right after you guys recorded that pod, and I read Chris's note this morning, so we'll talk about that. Chris is great at trying to identify the things in the market that you want to watch and the little things that change on a day-to-day basis, which are always interesting from a signal perspective and just some of the reasons that Strategus as a firm has had their antenna up over the last few weeks uh, just because of changes in the market, not necessarily turning bearish or, or all that concerned at this point, but uh, he does a great job of outlining some of those little indicators that we should watch on a daily basis. Well, it's interesting. I, I think generally, it seems like most market strategists, most investors, they seem generally optimistic um, about the stock market here, despite some of the macro headwinds. And we're going to talk about some of that. I want to start off kind of hitting a rundown. This is from a, a service called the Transcript that I use, and I thought was kind of interesting here. Um, you know, it was like three quotes, well, one from uh, Jamie Dimon, uh, one from Wells Fargo. Both of those companies reported earnings. Um, on Friday morning, one from Bank of America, which reports tomorrow. Oh, and then the fourth one from Andrew Jazzy, who is the CEO of Amazon. I think he sat down late last week uh, with Andrew Ross Sorkin from CNBC. Let me just get a quick rundown. I want to get your take on these quotes, Liz. This is from J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, in spite of the unsettling landscape, including last year's regional bank turmoil, the U.S. economy continues to be resilient with consumers still spending and markets currently expect a soft landing. It is important to note the economy is being fueled by large amounts of government deficit spending and past stimulus. So I want to talk about this. Well, let's break this one down for a second. So this whole idea of government deficit spending, I'm hearing this a lot from a lot of folks here. So that is basically being pinned to a lot of the economic performance that we're sort of seeing here, right? And so how long can this last? And I know that, you know, we had Steve Eisman um, down at the iConnections conference. You were down there. This was in late January. And he was asked that question, I think, by Melissa Lee, because a lot of folks have been talking about, you know, government spending and, and, and deficit spending and the like. And he's like, listen, as long as I've been in the business, whatever the number has been, the deficit, that's always been a boogeyman and we continue to keep moving forward. So why is it important right now? Why are some of the smartest minds that at least you and I follow, why are they putting their finger, you know what I mean, on this one right here, right now? Well, look, I mean, Steve's right about that, that as long as I've been in the business too, we talk about deficit spending and the government debt growing as a percentage of GDP as this issue that is someday going to become a problem. And it never really does. What we're looking at right now is the first question you asked is when does it become a problem or or when is it really something that we have to watch? I think the reason that we're talking about it right now is because it hasn't become a problem yet because people continue to buy treasuries. As long as people are going to buy the treasuries that we issue to cover that deficit, it's not really a problem. Now, there's been some weaker auctions, and that's why you've heard more about auctions lately than you normally do, because you look at the auction results and you want to find out what the appetite is for those treasuries. We had a pretty weak 10-year auction last week, which we covered on Market Call. So some of those are indications that the appetite is waning but it hasn't gone away. So, so far things are still okay. It's also not a secret 
about how much money the government has to borrow and how much they intend to issue in treasuries in order to cover that. So those numbers continue to get larger and they can be alarming when we see them on a daily basis. But the real issue here and the reason why I think we're hearing people talk about it is because at the beginning of the year, maybe the end of last year, even if this was still the case, even if we knew the government had to borrow this much money, we knew that treasury issuance was going to continue, we also expected that rates would be coming down. Now we're in a point where rates are not expected to be coming down. In fact, they've risen pretty abruptly over the last few weeks, but throughout the beginning of this year. So what does that mean? If you look at the really scary chart from the Congressional Budget Office about the interest expense of issuing all of these treasuries out into the future, the line is really strongly up and to the right, meaning that our interest expense is going to grow substantially over the next decade or so if we continuing if we continue issuing treasuries at this clip as rates stay high. Yeah. And, and the higher for longer narrative is something that a lot of folks have gotten, again, very comfortable with, but they're also uncomfortable with, let's just say, economic growth. A lot of that inflation that's kind of stuck around is kind of helping economic growth for all intents and purposes. And I guess where, where the rubber is going to hit the road is when the consumer runs out of steam. We got March retail sales data uh, this morning, which was better than expected. So we continue there. So let's let's take a check on, on this quote from uh, Charlie Scharf. He's the CEO of Wells Fargo. We can continue to see strength in the U.S. economy. Spending patterns and consumers using our debit and credit cards remain generally consistent and continue to grow year over year. Consumer credit is performing as we expect. Wholesale credit continues to perform well, and our views around commercial real estate have not significantly changed since last quarter. These are all positives. I'm sure he hit some negatives. Let's talk about the consumer credit. You know, like We know that retail sales don't really account for what percentage of those sales come, you know what I mean, at credit. He's not talking about defaults, but when he talks about it, he seems okay with it. And, you know, as Guy Adami likes to say, you know, consumer confidence is often just an overlay of the S&P 500 chart, right? And it's been pretty good. It's defied, you know, all levels of gravity that we would expect in the face of plenty of uh, macro headwinds. So talk to me about how you're feeling uh, on the consumer front here, because we're going to get a lot more data as we get into S&P 500, uh, just about how much these geopolitical issues are kind of weighing on consumers. And then I also think as we see the stronger dollars, we see higher yields, as we see higher commodity prices, as corporates, right, have pressure on their margins, right? So how much can they pass through to consumers? And that's going to be something I think that we learn a little bit about in Q2 guidance that we get hopefully over the next month or so. Yeah. So the retail sales number came in today, 0.7 uh, versus the estimate of 0.4. So definitely stronger than expected. If Guy were here, he would say something like what he always says about never bet against the consumer's willingness or desire to spend. And that still rings true. And And this would ring true for the direction of the market. And the reason that I think we're rebounding today is that there was a lot of optimism and a very strong momentum of optimism coming into even some of this trying time and, and some of the risks that we've learned about in the last week or so, it takes more than one event or a, a handful of headlines to turn that optimism entirely in the opposite direction. So I think that the desire for optimism to stick around is still there. A point about consumer confidence. So there are two ways that we measure consumer confidence. You get the University of Michigan and you get the conference board indexes. We just got the University of Michigan, and this is an important distinction. University of Michigan skews more towards inflation expectations and how consumers are feeling about prices. So what happened on Friday is that index came in below expectations, which is exactly what you would expect after some hotter than expected inflation prints and things that you can watch as sort of a precursor of that. If you look at what are called the break-evens, I mention those pretty often, but they're basically the market's way of telling us what the consumer and, and what the market expects inflation to be. The break-even levels of inflation for two years and five years have shot up over the last month, or two months, and really have been on a steady grind higher for the entirety of 2024. So as those continue to rise, you're going to see a lid put on the University of Michigan numbers. Conference board, on the other hand, skews toward the labor market. So how are people feeling about the jobs that they have or their expectation of getting a new job if they need one? So that index might look completely different depending on what the data before it is saying. That all said, the consumer is still spending. Maybe they're spending on credit and delinquencies are rising slightly, but they're still spending and they're going to continue spending. I'll say this un until it changes. 
the consumer will spend as long as the labor market stays strong. If people have jobs, they will spend their money. Unless that changes, this will continue. Yeah. So here's an interesting comment. This is from Bank America. Total card spending per household rose 0.3% year over year in March, following the leap year boosted 2.9% year over year increase in February. Um, so this is interesting. So you're seeing a deceleration, a, a big deceleration in the growth. And, you know, they put the term leap year in there. There's an extra day uh, in February. Um, so they're trying to explain that away. And then here is an interesting comment from Andy Jazzy, CEO of uh, Amazon. Consumers are spending, but they're just really being careful about what they spend on and how much they spend. And so whenever they can, they're trading down on an average selling price. So we've seen that concept of trading down. We've seen it in the dollar stores. We've heard this from McDonald's and some of the quick serve restaurants and the like here. So is that just kind of bolstering that view um, again that you know they continue to spend? They're spending on credit. We're seeing delinquencies, as you said, just tick up a little bit here. It just all feels like at some point, if we do have some sort of uh, reason for the consumer to stop spending. Maybe it's some sort of geopolitical event. And again, going back to last week's price action, you know, those are the sorts of things that freak CEOs out, right? Major disruptions in supply chains and the like here. And so, you know, if we see that behavior in the C-suite, you're certainly going to be seeing it by consumers, right? And the last piece of the puzzle here, and we'll probably kind of thread the needle a little bit towards to, to enterprise spending, right? As we get into some of these um, big tech companies, that's something that I really feel like, you know, is, is we haven't really talked about that since 2022, you know what I mean? And I wonder if that becomes a theme um, a little bit. Let, let's hit the trading down concept. Is that something that you expect to hear more of as we get through the spring here, Liz? Yes, but I think it's more in reaction to the fact that inflation has stayed high. I don't think it's necessarily in reaction to the fact that the consumer suddenly thinks that the economic fundamentals are worse than they were a month ago. I think people are trying to manage the idea that the bills are still high, higher than they were a year ago, much higher than they were two years ago. They just stopped growing as fast. So that trading down can happen for a number of reasons. It can happen because people are losing their jobs and they're trying to batten down the hatches, or I think in this instance, it's because of inflation. We just haven't seen that in such a long time that we haven't watched this consumer behavior shift. What I think is going to be the real challenge, and this goes towards maybe some of enterprise spending, but just the idea of corporate results for the rest of the year. The real challenge here is that last year is when corporations could easily pass through all of these inflationary pressures because everybody knew that it was happening. Everybody understood why it was happening. We didn't like it, but we understood it. So it was absorbed and consumers still spent the money. There isn't that freedom anymore to pass through increasing costs. And, and we've talked about this a little bit over the last week or so, especially where the costs are coming from. So the commodity complex rises, of course, that raises costs for a lot of companies, shipping costs, production costs, all of that stuff. But it's really tough to pass that through to the consumer because it doesn't make as much sense anymore on a one-to-one -one basis. So I think consumers will run out of the room to spend more and absorb those price increases, which means that corporations will run out of the competitive space to raise prices. And then you start to see margins really contract, which is what we expected to happen last year. And it didn't happen in a big way. Yeah. You know, and Guy has mentioned this a few times over the last couple months, you know, gasoline prices moving up right into the summer driving season doesn't particularly help. We know that rent prices have been really high. I mean, there's a whole host of things that people have to do. You know what I mean? They're cutting into, let's say, more discretionary spending. And you tweeted this out, I think on Friday, consumer inflation expectations for the next year and longer term moved up notably this month is what you're talking about. A continuation of this could put push rate cut expectations out further. You know, we're, we're sitting here and again, we're, you know, 20 minutes or so from the opening bell and, you know, the S&P futures are up nearly 80, 80 basis points, as I mentioned. So that's like nearly 40 handles um, that gets you maybe to like 5165 or something. We're not far off the all time highs in the S&P 500. Yet, Liz, we have a 10 year yield at 4.6 percent. The last time the 10 year yield, I think in September or early October was 4.6 percent. The S&P was 4,500. Okay, expectations for growth this year have definitely been ratcheted up over that six-month period um, or so. But again, the expectations of that growth, you know what I mean, were not predicated on a 4.6% 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. They were not predicated on the U.S. dollar index being where it is, near 106, 1% 1 from its 52-week highs. And so when the 10-year was at 5% in October, the 
U.S. dollar or the Dixie was at 107. We're at 106 right now. So, like to me, something has to give here. Either S and P earnings better really blow the doors out with guidance and visibility really good and very clear, or we're going to have a correction in the S&P 500, put a little fear back in investors and rethink what all of these different macro mechanisms, you know what I mean? What are their traditional relationships and why they're not working right now? Because to me, it really is just multiple expansion. We've also talked about when you look at the S&P 500 earnings, those top 10 names make up for a disproportionate amount of of the earnings, a disproportionate amount of the earnings growth that is expected. And at some point, I think you're probably going to want to discount a little bit of that top heaviness of the AI trade because they're also those companies, Microsoft in particular, the largest market cap company in the world, you know, it's trading 10 turns at a PE over where it was in October of 2022, if you think about that, right? So to me, those are sorts of things that I know valuation, not a good timing tool, but at some point there needs to be a little bit of fear put back in the S&P 500. Okay, a lot lot to unpack there. Let Let me start with the multiple expansion piece. What do we need in order for multiple expansion to continue? Generally speaking, you usually need conditions that are favoring looser financial conditions, rates falling, or at least rates low in order to support multiple expansion. That is obviously not the condition that we're in right now. And what you've seen, I've seen this even a couple times this morning already on charts from multiple research providers, the correlation between the 10-year yield and the S&P is again negative. Same thing with the 10-year yield and small caps if you're using the Russell 2000. So what does that mean? One of the things that I've talked about and that Mario and I have created charts about and tweeted about and written about is the relationship problem between yields and PEs and the idea that there's this huge divergence that doesn't normally happen where we've had yields rising, yet stocks still going up. Now we're getting back to a more normal sort of environment or relationship between those two variables, where as yields rise, stocks are falling. I think what happened was there was a pain point somewhere between 4.4 and 4.5 on the 10-year yield that stocks decided, you know what, this valuation was priced for looser monetary conditions, it was priced for really no exogenous shocks, and it's priced for strong, if not strengthening, earnings growth through the rest of the year which is fine. It's fine to be priced at that level. But the issue is then there's not a lot of tolerance for news that says otherwise. So now we've gotten news that says otherwise. We've gotten some news from the banks that said, okay, things are fine, but we didn't increase our expectations. We've got some news from geopolitical. Things were okay. It's hard to argue that things got better over the weekend. But what ended up happening is that the anticipation of the event ended up being worse than the event itself. So we're having a little relief in the futures today. The rest of it, you know, we're still waiting to find out. But markets were priced really for a good environment, a smooth sailing geopolitical environment, and really strong earnings. So now all of that would have to come to fruition. The last thing I would say is you mentioned something might have to happen here that maybe S&P needs to correct and fear needs to come back into investors. I would even put sort of a positive spin on that. Maybe it doesn't have to be fear, maybe just a right sizing of valuations to digest the fact that we're not getting cuts when we thought we were this year, to digest the fact that capital is going to be more expensive for a longer period of time than we thought, and that this is going to constrict the flow of funds around the globe for a while. That digestion process would probably cause a correction. I think that would be healthy from here, but it doesn't necessarily have to be this this huge fearful thing. Yeah, it's just interesting, you know. And, and let's talk about some single names, um, and let's talk about earnings in general. Like J P Morgan was trading at all time high. This is you know, um, you know, over a half a trillion dollar market cap, so the largest market cap uh, for any bank uh, on the planet. Um, it seems like Jamie Dimon, the CEO, can do no wrong there. And and again, a, a very uh, obviously savvy uh, market prognosticator. You know, he's been um, very hawkish on yields for a. Very very long time, right? And so um, he seems to be doing things and saying things um, about his bank and about the economy, um, you know, that are in contrast a little bit with the consensus, I think, you know what I mean? And and so um, the the reaction to their earnings, the reaction to the commentary around net interest margins with a stock down six and a half percent on Friday. I mean, that is one of the largest moves for JP Morgan post earnings, positive or negative, but, but at least, you know, when you think about it to the 
the downside, you know, people heading for the doors at the same time that I can remember outside of a, a sort of crisis period. So when you see a move like that in a market leader like that with a CEO who's considered the best, right? And, and you know, he always kind of tells it the way he sees it. Does that get your antennas up a little bit? Because, you know, I was on the, I was on the golf course at the Masters all day on Friday, did not have access to a phone and, oh, and fax that you. or anything like that. No, I know. I'm not complaining. <laughs> but when I when I got out of there at 630 on Friday evening and saw JP Morgan down six and a half percent, I mean, I, you know, I had to I had to look again. You know, you know what I'm saying? So talk to me about when you see that sort of single stock price action in a market leader. What does that do to you? Yeah, well, now let's be clear. Their results weren't bad. It wasn't because the results were bad. It was because they stayed how they were before. <laughs> so we have to be really clear about that piece. But they came out with net interest margin guidance for the rest of the year, and they didn't raise it. It sounded like investors were looking for a raise, and they didn't do that. Okay, that wasn't a negative result. I think this goes to where we were priced. We were priced for these expectations to be higher and higher and higher. And now when companies aren't delivering on even higher expectations in their guidance, they're getting punished for it. The move on Friday, and I don't know, we won't know until we watch how things shake out this week, but I'm suspicious that the move on Friday did have a lot to do with what I said before. The anticipation of an event is much worse than the actual event. Markets were jittery. Markets were down on Friday, largely in anticipation of the possibility of an oil spike because of this Middle East tension. We didn't know what was going to happen. And let's not forget that earlier in the week, we were worried about the Japanese central bank intervening in their currency and dumping a bunch of treasuries. We still don't really have an answer on if and when that's going to happen. So there were a lot of things geopolitically that built up to the end of the week. And I think investors just at large were jittery. And then you get a piece of news that says, oh, wait, this was below expectations. I've probably got a lot of gains in JP Morgan. They've done well those stocks where you've got a lot of gains and you start to get a little nervous, those are the easiest ones to unload. So I think it was probably an outsized reaction to the downside on news that really was not that negative. Yeah, I mean, the outperformance in JP Morgan versus many of the other money center banks has been, you know, obviously, you know, very noticeable. We've we pointed it out on many occasions, but it's important to also note if you're just looking at like facts at earnings estimates year over year for JP Morgan, they're expected to be down. You know, I look at a Tesla for the second consecutive year Year expected to be down. The fact that they made this announcement of at least 10% job cuts at Tesla, again, that's like could be 14,000 jobs, you know, a week before they're going to report Q1 earnings. We already have their Q1 deliveries, which were very disappointing. But you say to yourself, okay, this is another half a trillion dollar market cap company with expected earnings to be down. Apple, this morning, we wake up, Bloomberg's reporting that iPhone shipments down 10% year over year in Q1. This is a company where expectations for earnings growth is at best at mid single digits. So if you have two consecutive quarters of down 10%, let's just say, right, they don't do a phone refresh until the fall and people are not upgrading the way they were in these past cycles anymore. So any Apple analyst trying to tell you about all the phones that are four years old and there's going to be an upgrade super cycle and AI on the chip is going to you know, change the game for Apple. Well, that's not coming at least until 2025. So whatever announcements that you get on AI at Worldwide Developers Forum in June for Apple, that's at least a year away, by the way, unless there's some sort of software acquisition and they're able to, you know, do something there. So I'm looking at some very large companies where earnings expectations are at least negative or much lower than what the S&P right now is priced for, like 11, 12 percent year over year earnings growth. So uh, that's one of the reasons, Liz, you know, we track individual names like this, also large market caps, large contributors to earnings. So thoughts here as we get into this week, we're going to have a bunch more banks. We're going to have American Express on Friday. That will be really interesting. We've gotten lots of different cross currents from luxury and the higher end consumer over the last couple of months or so. What are some of the names that like you think that we should focus on um, a little bit? And I'll just kind of throw out a bunch of them that are set to report. Tomorrow morning, Bank of America, Johnson & Johnson, United Health, and Morgan Stanley. Wednesday after the close, United Airlines. That'll be interesting. We did have Delta last week, but just basically with fuel costs and geopolitics and, and the like here and who's traveling where into an expected, um, you know, busy summer travel season. We have uh, DR 
are Horton on Thursday. Netflix is going to kick off uh, tech earnings and then Blackstone. But again, American Express on Friday. Procter & Gamble might be interesting Friday morning to hear um, from a staple there and Schlumberger also. Any of those stick out to you? Any sectors in particular you really want to focus on right now? Yeah, well, obviously, we're, we're already about halfway through the big financials, but Bank of America is always an interesting one, mostly for the reason that they skew a lot more towards consumer lending. So it's a good read on the consumer lending sector, the financial piece of the consumer. So that's an important one to watch and listen to. Staples in general, I would be watching very closely through this earnings season for the reason that I mentioned before. Staples last year benefited a lot from these price increases and the inflated revenues that occurred because of it, consumers absorbed that. And you saw some really strong results from Staples. Some of them claimed that there was growth happening and that they were taking share or whatever the case may be. But in reality, a lot of it was driven by inflationary revenues. So if that has slowed down, where do they maintain their margins from? And I think that's an important thing to watch across all Staples. Any consumer facing business, and, and this goes towards the theme that I was talking about earlier too, we're priced for certain things to stay strong, if not get stronger. And one of the tenets of this strength has been the consumer and consumer spending. If we start to hear from consumer companies, particularly discretionary companies, that they're expecting the consumer to slow down or that they're already seeing the consumer slow down, or that they're having inventory problems because the consumer has changed their taste, that's something to watch and listen to and make sure that you're paying attention to going into the second and third quarter. All right. A lot of Fed speak this uh, this coming week. Uh, Jerome Powell is speaking. Um, and, and I think that'll be interesting in light of just kind of what's gone on um, between Iran and Israel. And again, um, you know, a much better outcome than, than, than most feared, let's say, on Friday afternoon. And hopefully there'll be um, some sort of kind of de-escalation here, no major damage caused um, in Israel. So maybe, you know, no harm, no foul. They said they were going to retaliate. They did. Oil kind of moved up in anticipation of that. It's kind of come off a little bit. So that would be, I think, a best case um, scenario. Might these Fed speakers get a bit more dovish uh, because of and, and so the last thing I just want to focus on is like, what does dovish mean right now? Because the Fed normally in these sort of geopolitical dust ups would lean towards that. They'd lean towards, you know, the sort of monetary support, you know what I mean, that they can give. But if they are to do that for any reason, it would really um, exacerbate, I think, a little bit some of these inflation worries right now. Right. And so like that's the thing, like they're really kind of in a box here, Liz. They are. And I think what the Fed is going to end up watching, first of all, this is a perfect example of why the Fed looks at core PCE, because it removes oil. The reason that they remove oil and energy is because they don't want to look like they should be reacting to events that are entirely outside their control, first of all, and events that would cause a short-term reaction, but not a long-term reaction. They shouldn't change monetary policy based on a short-term spike in something that may just be relieved in a couple of weeks. So that is this is a perfect example of why we look at core. I don't think the Fed is going to be too bothered by some of these headlines. I think that the breaking point, and Mario and I are going to do some work on this this week, the breaking point is, let's say there is a spike in oil. Let's say gas prices do go up. There's a point where you look at the percentage that consumers have to spend on gasoline as a percentage of disposable income. And over history, where it starts to get untenable is right around four and a half percent of disposable income. So we'll have to do some work about what gas price that is. It, none of it's a perfect science, but we can probably get to a range of like, okay, that's going to start to really put pressure on the consumer. The Fed is going to feel it. Inflation expectations will look really scary at that point. That's when it becomes a problem. But I don't think we're going to hear from them coming out with, oh, we need to cut more. And frankly, the market doesn't think so either. We're still at 23% for June, total coin flip for July, not even a full cut priced in for September. First full cut isn't priced in until November. So all of this over the weekend didn't move those expectations very much. Yeah. And, and and again, I mean, I think that, you know, the hotter data that we get, every single one is going to chip away at those odds for a cut, um, because I don't think it really does a whole heck of a lot for the economy if we haven't felt the long and variable lags of all those hikes just yet, at least as it relates to the consumer. I don't know how the consumer would benefit from a 25 basis point cut just, you know, fairly randomly at any point. All right. Last thing before we get to the conversation with Chris Verone, you know, it is interesting, Liz, that a 
lot of the charts on the indices that I look at, a lot of sector charts I look at, and a lot of individual names, no surprise, they're kind of breaking down, right? We've had this really like kind of, you know, orderly rally off of the October lows. If you just look at almost every major US equity index, it just looks like a series of, you know, higher lows and higher highs. Um, I don't think there's been a bigger than a, two and a half percent pullback in the S&P, right, from those uh, levels here. Right now, we're probably at that sort of level. But um, I say to myself here, you know, the technicals are, are starting to break down a little bit. And I look at the S&P 500 chart and, you know, there was this gap on February 22nd. It happened to be the day uh, after that NVIDIA reported, uh, you know, results that I thought were good. I thought they were kind of baked in the cake, but semis got going. And it's just interesting over the last, let's call it two weeks or so, we've seen some major announcements of some funding for this morning at Samsung getting six and a half billion dollars to, to make plants here. This is from the Chips Act, right? We've seen it with Taiwan Semi. We've seen it with Global Foundries. We've seen it with Intel. Um, I think they're doling out over $40 billion or so. You know, the semis have been massive outperformers. That's why I go back to that February 22nd date. There are such high expectations for NVIDIA, despite the fact of all those names that I just mentioned, Taiwan Semi is really the only one that's acted particularly well over the last month or so. And so I just wonder if there's a gap fill back to that kind of level uh, in the S&P just below 5,000, that would be a 5% peak to trough drawdown. And at that point, if Q2 guidance really doesn't come in, then I think we should be on our way to you know a down 10% correction, which by the way, we get every year for the most part in the S&P 500. We've gone you know, a very long time without a very bad one-day move. I think you've been tracking this down 2%. We have not seen it in over a year. So thoughts on the technicals right here? Yeah, well, we, we keep counting the days. 289 days now, I think we've made it without a 2% correction in the S&P. We thought, we thought maybe for a second we'd get it on Friday, but it didn't happen. Um, so a, a couple of things about sentiment and things that you can watch because sentiment is such a hard thing to to try to measure. And it's sort of, you just feel it in the market. But this, these are two things directly from Chris Verone's note from this morning. And one thing that he's been watching and, and is a little bit of a concern is the idea that utilities stocks have caught a bid at the same time as the 10-year yield has risen. You don't usually see it happen in tandem because utes are defensive plays, but they're also big dividend payers. So usually you see them benefit as yields fall, as investors try to find other ways to get income from their investments. So utes up with 10-year yields up is a little bit more of a defensive signal and something to watch. This next one that he constantly issues in his notes uh, and I think is important to discuss given what you just said. So the technicals are, are breaking down in certain places. If you look at consumer staples relative to consumer discretionary, so if that line were moving up, it would mean that discretionary was outperforming staples. For the most of this year, discretionary has been outperforming, which is generally a pro-cyclical signal. Consumers are spending. We're in a, a positive cyclical part of the cycle. What's happened recently is that the ratio has just paused. It started to just move sideways in a pretty tight range. So hard to say yet that it's completely broken down, but it has paused. So the euphoria or the optimism in it has slowed down. And I think that's where much of the market is right now. I, I won't say that it's a waiting game, but I do think that we exhausted the rally in, in many ways and that it's difficult to convince people to keep buying at these valuation levels as yields rise. So we're in this sort of pause. Let's see what happens. Let's make sure that there aren't risks that we don't know about. And we're in the beginning of earnings season. Let's pause and find out if companies can meet this really high expectation that we have, if they can, then I think the market does find another leg upward. But what I think we're hearing already is that maybe they're not meeting these high and and sometimes outrageous expectations yeah. that investors have. Well, it's just, just, listen, I go back to that move that we had in the 10-year yield from 4% um, in early September to you know 5% in late October. And then we found our way from 5% down to 3.8% by the end of the year or so. Well, here we are. We're slowly working our way up for a whole host of different reasons that we were working our way up towards 5% in the fall. 
And I guess the biggest thing that I'll just say is when yields started coming down, they came down because of Fed speak, because of the expectation of a rate cutting cycle in 2024 that we just spent 30 minutes giving a whole host of reasons why that is not likely coming in, in a meaningful way. So at some point, you're looking at a 10 year year yield right now at 4.6 percent. And you're saying to yourself, what are the reasons to cause it to go lower? What are the reasons to cause the dollar to go lower? What are the reasons to cut? commodities to go lower. I can't come up with too many. So again, just to bookend this whole conversation, the last thing that doesn't make a lot of sense to me is an S&P just below 5,200, but we'll see how that plays out this week. I think it'll probably have more to do with earnings expectations than geopolitics. But again, our crystal balls, they're often pretty fuzzy here, Liz. Um, (laughs) I appreciate you being here early on a Monday morning. Thanks so much. You'll be back with me on Market Call, I think twice this week, I think the people are gonna get you here, Liz. So maybe not, I don't know, maybe, I think so. Um, And so check back for that. Um, Carter Braxton Worth's gonna be Market Call with me, one o'clock Eastern, a couple days this week also. Uh, Guy is on a working vacation uh, and he'll be back next Monday. So Liz, thanks so much. Stick around for my conversation with Chris Verone of Strategus. All right, welcome back to On The Tape. I am Dan Nathan, I am joined by Chris Verone. He is a partner and head of technical and macro research at Strategus. Chris, welcome to the pod. Dan, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, you and I have known each other for a long time. We've been doing CNBC together. Uh, It feels like at least a decade um, or so. And it's interesting because I remember when you first started coming on, um, you were very focused on technical analysis. I think over the last 10 years, you really broadened out a great deal to doing macro research and strategy. And at a firm like Strategus, um, you know, it, it seems like a really important tool uh, in, in an investing slash trading sort of toolbox. Um, talk to me a little bit how your career in technical analysis has kind of, you know, like emerged over the last decade or so. Um, I just know the conversations that we have on the desk of Fast Money. It's not all about charts. Um, you're thinking about things, um, you know what I mean? Like it, just with lots of different inputs. Um, Talk to us a little bit about that. And then I'd love to hear a little bit about how you think, you know, investor psychology has changed towards technical analysis over the last 10 or 15 years or so. Yeah, Dan, that's a great question. Well, first, thanks for having me on. Uh, We've gotten to know each other over really the last two decades. Um, I've been looking at the chart for almost 20 years. And I think, you know, ironically, a lot of technicians tend to ultimately gravitate more towards the strategy side or more towards macro uh, it was kind of the other way for me. I, I began with a background in economics and strategy and macro and found myself over time um, really conceding that the market would always be a better strategist than I would be, or that the market would always be a better um, economist or policy analyst than I ever would be. And just listening to the signals, the price signals, the changes, specifically the changes at the margin, right? It's never about good or bad, it's better or worse. And I think the market is the best communicator of that. So as my career has progressed, almost two decades here at Strategus, I think if anything, I've become more beholden to what the message of the charts is uh, every day. My partners, Jason Trenner, who runs uh, our strategy and macro, we let him worry about all the, all the smart things, all the PhD level type stuff. Um, I like to use the market as a communicator of ideas. And to this day, I still have found no better medium to express uh, what I think the world is articulating towards than the charts themselves. We like to say charts are the language of Wall Street, and that certainly comes through uh, in our written research. Yeah. So when you started, let's say, nearly two decades ago, you were primarily obviously speaking to an institutional um, client base. You know, many of those folks are do deep fundamental work, right? And you probably had walked into a few boardrooms um, in your day where some of these PMs or, or traders are like, listen, dude, like whatever you're, you're selling, I'm not buying. You know what I mean? So talk to me how the psychology has changed a bit because, you know, I came into the markets in the late 90s as a long short equity trader. And the guy who trained me that that I worked for, I was an assistant trader. I mean, one of my jobs was to look over hundreds of charts a night and look for different patterns and come in with those lists of, of those sorts of patterns. And so to me, I was trained in technical analysis and not the way you were, um, but, but it was a really important input into my process. And so I'm curious, how has like psychology changed around the services that you provide to the street over the years? 
You know, it's a great question because you do encounter what I would almost describe as a hubris out there of, oh, I don't look at charts or um, I- I'm smarter than that. I'm better than that. But, you know, I, what I think is funny when you go back or if you have the, the luxury, the good fortune of, of meeting and talking with or spending time with some of the great investors ever or reading about them, watching the interviews with the, the Stan Druckenmillers or the Steve Cohen's or the Scott Bessons, uh, the Paul Tudor Jones, what you'll learn is charts are a really, really big part of their process. It's almost like cheating, right? I can, in two or three hours on a Sunday night, sit down and get a really thorough understanding, looking at two, three, 400 charts of what the market's attempting to communicate to us. It's frankly a remarkable time saver. It tells you where to look, where you should be focusing, where you should be spending your time and your capital. And I'm just still struck by, you know, there are those holdouts out there, you know, I'll, I'll never look at charts. If it's good enough for some of the legends in the business, um, probably should be good enough for you. And I don't know, Dan, you're someone who's respected the charts and the, the message the market is sending for a long time. And, you know, one of the things that I, I, I still to this day, I look forward to on Sunday nights sitting down and going through our whole chart deck with the the hope or the anticipation that you might find that next clue. And you know, it's a lot like cards, it's a lot like poker. You don't know what the next card of the deck might be, but I think the charts tell you where you should be looking or what you should be prepared for. It's funny, you know, that the intersection of this business with so many other pursuits is something that fascinates me. A a mentor of mine um, recently suggested I go back and reread Ted Williams' The Science of Hitting. I'm sure you remember the book written in 1970, from arguably the greatest hitter of all time. And he said, go back and reread it through the lens of an investor. And I did that over the last couple of weeks. And the takeaways from this are so relevant to how we go about our work every day. Swing at strikes, be quick with the bat, Every at bat is a new approach that is so familiar. Stay within the trends. You know, guess from a frame of reference. Don't just guess curveball or fastball. Don't just guess tech or energy, but guess from a frame of reference. So all of that is instrumental into how we go about our work uh, each day. Yeah, no doubt. It's interesting. You know, if you if you're brought up in the markets, it depends what sort of market you're brought up and what you're like who you are in the market. I guess if you're just a deep fundamental you know, equity research analysts focused on a sector and the like, you know, I could see why a chart would not be interesting to you, right? Your, your job is to kind of get that company's fundamentals right, get the entry and exit points correct, get some of the comparative valuation stuff correct, that sort of thing. But, you know, when I was sitting on a desk in 1997 and 98 and I had a phone glued to my ear to the CME and I'm quoting the S&P futures all day long for the guy that I work for and he's picking levels in which to get long or get short or cover or take a profit, that sort of thing, or where to set stops, the charts. And even, in, you know, people, I guess, you know, think about day charts differently than they think about, you know, like like intraday charts versus all that sort of stuff. To me, it was just like like bludgeoned into my brain how important those pictures were to the sorts of process um, that we had. And then it was really interesting to kind of broaden it out to equities. And then it was interesting to broaden it out to options trading. How do we choose strikes? How do we choose a strike that I want to sell against something that I'm long? You know, all those sorts of things are really interesting to me. So tell me in your strategy work, you know, how different is it looking at some intraday patterns versus looking at a, an equity pattern versus looking at an indice. You know, I'm just curious how you think about these different buckets of securities. I think what you learn over time, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, is that you develop a feel for all different types of markets. The commodity market trades differently than the equity market. The equity market trades differently than the fixed income market. Bond yields tend to peak very climatically, but bottom over long bases. Equities tend to do the opposite. They tend to bottom very climatically, but peak over long periods of time. So it's really through experience that I think you get that that skill set. We have an approach with our work. uh, We call it first imagine, then investigate, and then either implement or publish, right? Depending if you're talking about the, the sell side or the buy side of a seat we now strap. And what I have found is that the imagination process is probably the most intellectual or philosophically fulfilling because it allows your mind to go down avenues about what could happen, what the world could look like. But the investigation part of the equation, which is the next step for us, is 
looking at the charts and asking, does the market agree with whatever I think should happen? And what I've just learned in my career, I, I think the best who have done this are very good at differentiating between what should happen and what will happen. They're often very, very different. And the market gives us the best lens into what will happen. I, I think if we brought that debate to the current today, the, 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 the topic of the hour is, should the Fed cut or will the Fed cut? And the answers to those might be very, very different. And I'll take the market's opinion on that over my own any day of the week. And you know, when we start to you know, get into certain names or sectors or groups, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, um, the approach of whether you're looking at interday charts or daily charts or weekly or monthly charts is still governed by the, by the same principles. And for me, that's an unapologetic adherence to trend following and momentum. Uh, I'm very much, um, you know, kind of steal the old George Soros alchemy of finance uh, approach of momentum, right? What's going up tends to keep going up. Um, and you better be involved in the trend. You better be involved uh, in the momentum, but you also watch your back for when, when that might be starting to change. And that's where I think the charts do a much better job than almost any other tool we can think of in kind of identifying that. Yeah. So if you're listening to this podcast right now and you're like a self-directed um, investor, maybe you'd like to trade also, um, you know, you think about all the different ways that you come about an idea. You might be reading uh, a, you know, a newspaper story about some trend that's going on in some industry and you might not have some knowledge about it and you might like start to dig and see what companies are publicly traded and how they've acted and what their earnings have been and what analysts expect for future earnings and, you know, all the sorts of inputs that go in there, right? Let, let's just say that's your process. And we know a lot of people like that, right? We get questions all the time from people, usually within their industry. Hey, what do you think of this company? You know, I came across this, that, or what do you think when people finally then do all of that work and then they go and they look at a chart? What do you think? So this is self-directed, not trained like you and me, not staring at fact set machines, you know, like from 8 a.m. in the morning till 4 p.m. in the afternoon and then going to talk about it on TV or going into boardrooms and giving presentations about this sort of stuff. What do you think the most consistent mistake that self-directed investors make by like, but as it relates to charting, as it relates to technical analysis in general? And, and, and what would your prescription be to avoid that mistake? Well, uh, I, I, I will uh, humbly concede, I, I think the, the mistake that's often made by many, I certainly make myself. And it's forgetting the principles of trend following. And the reality is over effectively 100 plus years of back tests, a stock that is above an upward sloping 200 day moving average will annualize at a higher rate of return with lower volatility than a stock trading below a downward sloping 200 day moving average. Of course, there's exceptions. Of course, there's periods of mean reversion. But if you don't have the resources or the time that Dan, you or myself may have, uh, my simple rule would be only own things above upward sloping 200-day moving averages. It's a simple way to protect you from the calamity, from, from the big mistake. And the big mistake in this business is not being late to a bottom or, or too early in calling a top. The big mistake is... Um, letting the profit go away, or uh, being involved in a stock that's in a clear downtrend. Those are where all the mistakes happen. So it's funny, this may sound like overly simplistic advice. If I was in a boardroom or seeing a long short hedge fund today on 57th Street and they asked me the same question, I would give the exact same answer. Um, trend following has stood the test of time uh, and is just the the key approach to how we go about what we do every yeah, day. Yeah, and I guess the hard part, you know, again, this is over my now near three decade career um, in this business is that the problem is, is that so many people that are fundamentally driven, they they have to buy into a story, right? And so, you know, you know, and and so sometimes when the stock is not acting the way that they hope it will relative to the fundamental work that they did, sometimes they just don't want to believe a chart either. That that's the other thing, you know. You, you know, and Dan is. You know, every morning I take a very early trade from Connecticut to Grand Central and I'll read journal FT New York Times, not because I'm particularly interested in what the articles say. I'm interested in whether the market agrees with what's on the front page of the newspaper. Um, 
that's the value in using the market as identifying whether a, a trend or a theme is overdone, overplayed, too crowded. I mean, how often, I'm sure you've experienced it, you spend weeks working on a, an idea or a, a theme or a topic only to look at the positioning data, thinking you've uncovered kind of the greatest idea ever. Then you look at the uh, CFTC data and you realize everyone's already there, right? right? So it, this is about um, you know, understanding when the market begins to push back or disagree with what might be on the front page of the newspaper or what might be in the quarterly report or might be in the company's latest investor day. Yeah, all right, before we do a little vibe check on the markets and, and some of the kind of um, you know risk assets that we we, we kind of obsess over uh, on a daily basis, at least on, on Fast Money when we're on together or you know us on our podcast, I wanna just quickly talk about, you mentioned this, you were on Fast Money the other day with us, uh, you just launched a new ETF. It's a tactical ETF. The ticker is SAMM. Talk to me about this. Is this one of the first products like this from Strategus? And how, how did you get involved in it? And, and what's the strategy? Yeah, great question. And we're super excited about this. This is um, a new step for us uh, as a firm, kind of getting into the active uh, ETF space. The ticker is uh, SAMM. That stands for Strategus Macro Momentum. And Really, what it's designed to do, or, or what um, what our goal is, is to take our written institutional research uh, that that clients see every day and turn it into a very investable product based on the principles of what we've talked about: trend following, momentum, behavioral inputs, contrarian opinion. Um, it, it has the ability to basically go anywhere through ADRs, touch different geographies, different asset classes, gold, treasuries, cash but always with an emphasis on seeking out the momentum corners of the market wherever and whenever they may evidence themselves. Um, this is our third kind of push into the active ETF space. My partners, Jason Trenner and Dan Clifton also run funds. Uh, Jason's fund, SAMT, is more of the thematic side, identifying the big themes with longer staying power. And Dan Clifton does all of our policy work um, I've had launched a fund called SAGP, which looks at lobbying intensity in government and overweighting those companies that 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 um, that lobby the government with intensity. Uh, our fund is by nature designed to be the more tactical uh, of these, really seeking to exploit momentum. Um, and we're super excited about it. We launched last Thursday, so we're a week in to the money management business, but uh, hoping to have some fun and hopefully pick some good stocks. Well, we'll look forward to hearing more about it. I know we'll be hearing more about it when you come on uh, Fast Money because I'm sure some of the, the, the great um, you know ideas are gonna make them their way into the uh, the content that we get to hear from you uh, on the show. Um, let, let's talk about the markets here. You know, it, it's interesting. We're getting to, um, you know, just the doorstep of Q1 earnings, um, you know, despite a lot of skepticism that remains out there, um, you know, as it relates to, let's say, the economy, as it relates to corporate earnings, you know, the S&P 500 is what, 2% uh, uh, tops off of its, you know, all-time high just recently made here. Um, you know, we have yields that, you know, the excitement, I, I think, in the equity markets late last year was that they were going to be coming down. And, and there really has not been any indication um, in the last, call it, month or so that the Fed um, is going to be cutting rates anytime soon. We're seeing the June rate cut odds. If we're looking at the CME Fed Funds tracker, they're kind of, you know, going away. They're on the wrong side of a coin flip here. Uh, uh, so, Talk to me a little bit about how you're thinking about this relationship between the S&P 500 that really got going uh, late last year when it broke out about 4,600 on the notion that rates were going lower, right? And that earnings growth was going to be easier to achieve. And now, you know, it is higher for longer, but there's still this sentiment that double digit earnings growth for S&P 500 is okay. So yields going up and equities going up are fine, except for the fact it seems to be some momentum coming out of the equity market right now. You know, Dan, I, I think when you look back at 2023 last year, I think at least for the first half of the year, there was a decent excuse to miss a lot of what happened. It was a very, very narrow market. As you know, the macro did not look particularly good. But really the game change for, for us was, it was a day in late October, I think we were maybe 24, 25 to one on the upside, advancers over decliners. And Days like that historically are so, so rare, looking at nearly 100 years worth of data. 
And then I think we backed it up with a couple more similar kind of internal days uh, over the next week or so. That is the escape velocity go sign that you have to put away whatever macro reservation you may have and, and get involved. And I think the irony is, my suspicion is that that move at the time was predicated on bond yields going down and staying down. I think if you had told me on November 1st where bond yields would be here in early April, um, the irony is I probably would have gotten the equity call wrong. <laughs> I was fortunate to get bond call wrong because it meant we got stocks right. And I think that's the tension here again as kind of the first quarter transitions into the second quarter and we look towards summer. At what level yields do we start to upset the consensus? Do we start to upset equities? What I would watch for, it's just kind of been my experience. And, and, and this is where I think changes at the margin are, are so important. If there's something I've noticed the last maybe two weeks, I'm sure you've seen it as well. There's a little better tone about these utilities. There's a little bit better tone about these staples. I always kind of raise my antenna a little bit when, you know, what, what are the classically defensive groups actually start to behave a little bit, uh, bit better, even as bond yields uh, are, are ratcheting up higher. Certainly gold seems unbothered by, by what we've seen here in rates as well. I was looking this morning, gold's six-month change is in the 99th percentile historically. So there's some macro clues out there. I, I, I kind of agree with your assessment that maybe this is an equity market that's tired. I would say at the moment, it still feels more rotationary than it does outright distributive. Uh, I'll, I'll give the trend the benefit uh, uh, of the doubt here. I think things I would be mindful of, say NVIDIA under 840 would kind of raise an antenna about a bigger bigger problem to the momentum trade. I'd want to watch these utilities, look at Dominion, look at Duke. If they start to break out here, it looks like they might. Maybe another clue that this is starting to get a touch more defensive. Yeah, it's interesting. And the point about yields is a good one. You know, if I think back to that period where the S&P broke out, you know, above 4,600, um, it was basically in that mid-December Fed presser where, you know, the market became convinced there was going to be six rate cuts next year. And they were going to be able to do it for good reasons, not for bad reasons, right? And so the 10-year yield was, you know, four one one or something like that. Well, here we are at, you know, four, three, five or so. Um, you know, we have some inflation data coming out that by the time people are listening to this, they'll know um, what that is. It'll be interesting to see if it's hot where yields go and, and what the reaction is, you know, to the stock market because the stock market is just below 5,200, but it was back at 4,600 the last time yields were, you know, you, you know, you know what I'm saying? So like, so that, that's the, that's the hard part here. I got plenty of stuff wrong last year, but even into that late October period, man, things felt bad. Like they did not feel particularly good. A lot of air was coming out of some of the big, the big trades that helped get us there to the highs in July. Now, Dan, I, I think this goes back to something I alluded to earlier. There's a difference in this business between what should happen and what will happen. Um, I mean, I look around, I, I don't think there's a ton of evidence that financial conditions are particularly tight. I, I think quite the opposite. Um, yet, it seems like the Fed is intent on cutting rates regardless. I think certainly the ECB is intent on cutting rates. We saw it with the Swiss a couple of weeks ago. Is that not what gold is attempting to suggest to us? I mean, this has been, doing this a long time, this has been an explosive, explosive move in right. gold. Let, let, let's talk about gold because, you know, this is, this is a great debate, in my opinion, because I, I actually think we're going to look back at some point in the fall and the Fed will not have cut rates because they know there's no there's no politically like sound reason to do that. If you if you are one of those people who believe that the administration could put pressure on the Fed because like, like cutting rates right now would be the exact wrong thing for them to do if they're really most focused on fighting inflation, right, and, and helping consumers. So to me, I think there's a good chance that those rate cuts get pushed out. So what is gold then? Let's just say we know that, and we don't know that, but let's just say we know that, and let's just say gold continues to march higher the way it has. What is gold telling you then about, I guess, well, let's take it away from the market, about the economy? So it's funny, gold is always thought of kind of that in the spirit of bar talk or cocktail chatter. It's, it's always thought about sending some ominous message about the future. But if you look at the history of gold, it's acted as both a risk on and a risk off indicator. It was certainly risk on from, you know, 02 to 06, certainly risk on 
at points during the the middle uh, part of the aughts from maybe call it 2013 um, forward. So this idea that gold always sends a risk-off message, I think is a little misleading. If it is sending a risk-off message, I would suspect other things have to start to sing from the same hymn. I would expect to see credit conditions reflect some stress. I would expect to see leadership, as we talked about, not just subtly go more defensive, but overtly go more defensive. So I think those are the signposts that we probably need to at least pay more attention to, given gold's move. Um, what we know is, so if gold is a risk on and a risk off indicator, it has a reputation as both. What we know has only been a risk on indicator is Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is really important here in kind of in determining what the liquidity fabric of, of this market is. I don't think if you're long risk assets, I don't think you want to see Bitcoin sub 64,000, maybe 63,000. 50 day moving average is right around there. That was kind of a low from uh, uh, late March, early April. That I think would be a very important, again, in the spirit of puzzle pieces and clues, I think that would be a, a very important puzzle piece or clue that maybe liquidity conditions are actually starting to get tighter. Yeah, and I, I agree, that, you know, on a different level, the correlation, let's say, of Bitcoin to like the generative AI trade, the, the super micro, the NVIDIA, that seems to be there because it's a different buyer of those things than the folks that are buying gold, most likely. You could make an argument why you might look at a scarce risk asset like Bitcoin and try to equate it to the reason why you would buy gold, right? But you could also make the argument of why you want to buy Bitcoin because you're really excited about all of the possibilities that generative AI um, on the equity side pose too. You know what I mean? I, I want to go back to, to gold though for a second, Chris. And, and, and I know you can envision this because that's all you do. You're like a beautiful mind. You see charts in your head here. If we look at this gold chart, okay, we go back five years. It had this nice ramp from like 1300 to above, just above 2000 in 2020. Okay, we know what was going on in 2020. Then it pulled back and then it had another move back to about 2020 in 2022. Okay, then it pulled back significantly again to 1600 or so. And in 2023, had a move back above 2000, very near 2020. You know, pulled back based, got back up to those levels. And then it's literally been from 2000 to 2350 in a straight line. So it broke out of this really big base. And if you look at it on a log basis, it just looks like, you know, like that much better. So could this move just be technical? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like rather than try to read some tea leaves into all the economic uh, mumbo jumbo, could it just be this really long base? And finally, just so a whole bunch of folks just went for it. See, that's the easy explanation. That's the explanation I love. I don't need to know why. I need to know where to be and when. When something potential turns kinetic. And gold's been potential for years, right? This basing, basing, basing. It went kinetic for one reason or another over the last four or five weeks. I'm sure in due time, that reason will reveal itself. By the time it does, you probably want to be a seller of gold, not a buyer of gold. I know my technical friends are going to hate me when I say this. Um, I don't particularly care. I'm not a big pattern guy. I think patterns are whatever the eye chooses to see on, on any given day that fits some preconceived narrative. If there was one pattern, though, that I would actually put some weight or emphasis behind, it is that cup and handle. It's the name that or the stock or the commodity that's been consolidating on a prior high and for coming out of a big base. And, and gold has really fit that description from a purely technical approach. You could get something like 25, 2600 on gold before you even start to talk about, you know, what what the real long-term target might be. I don't think it's out of the question. There is, um, I'm going to steal this term from a, mentor, from, um, from a mentor of mine, but there is momentous momentum behind gold here. And when you see momentous momentum, you typically want to play. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you one last thing. Let's go back to the Bitcoin again, because I'm glad you brought it up in that capacity. You know, when I look at this chart and I look at it, um, on a log basis, again, those double tops that we saw in 2021, 2022, uh, and where we are right now, I, I mean, this thing looks, it also looks like a cup and handle, doesn't it? And it looks like it's about to explode too. So this is one where to me, I'm just curious what your thoughts are. I once got in a fight with a technician about Bitcoin uh, on the set of Fast Money. Um, he, th he thought I was be <laughs> being a big lib or something like that. But um, you know, this is one where people get emotional about, but this thing, it's just interesting how the sentiment has changed towards this uh, risk asset, if you will, over the last five years. And there's been some 
tremendous, you know, like moves uh, both up and down or so. Is it starting to get a level of legitimacy in your book? Well, you know, I think there's two, there's, there's two things here. I, I'd say number one, from a diagnostic perspective, I think Bitcoin's value to me is literally worth its weight in, I guess, data or gold, whatever the expression would be in, in this instance. Um, it is such a pure reflection of the liquidity regime that we've been living in since post-Great Financial Crisis. So I use it from a diagnostic perspective. Now, they also say in this business that nothing makes you more, uh, uh, more furious or, or upset than the person next to you making money on something that you didn't think was worth your time. And uh, I, I can say I, I got Bitcoin right the first big move into 21 and early 22. I have not played this time around. I think it's resting. I think it's consolidating here. But from a f purely chart perspective, I would like to buy a breakout uh, to a new high. If you go back and just back test this thing, what it has made new highs, it hasn't typically stopped. Uh, there's been runway after that move. Now, we can talk about, again, what it means or what the implications are. I think that's less important. Um, reading the chart, uh, it's still pretty good here. You know what's funny? I'm not involved either. And I'll just say this just to, to finish out the Bitcoin conversation is like, the one thing that I worry about now um, is that there's so many folks that might have very weak hands that got exposed to this, let's say, through these spot Bitcoin ETFs, right? And, and so I think to myself, there are people who are gaming that um, demand, right? And so we've seen you know pullbacks being bought over the last few weeks or so, especially after that huge ramp that it had. So I wonder if there is a reason to sell it and make no mistake about it over the last 10 years that, you know, and specifically, let's say the last five or six that that like a lot of folks like us have been watching it very closely. When it pulls back, you know, you can have a 50 percent pullback to have that in a stock or something like that is not something that most investors are used to. So I just wonder if it has the potential to snowball. And that's one of the reasons why. I'd probably be a little careful buying the breakout right here, but you know what I mean? I see what you see also. Yeah, you know, I I think tactically, a lot of the momentum stuff, just kind of looking at my screens, I think a lot of the momentum stuff is heat. I don't think it's topping, and I think that's a distinction that sometimes doesn't get enough attention in this business. A, a, a pause or a rest or even a correction while unpleasant is actually generally where opportunities are reimagined. And to buy... What I would describe as oversold conditions and uptrend is uh, among the most desirable kind of um, uh, a spot on a trend to be involved. I, I do think we'll get that opportunity in stuff like Bitcoin, maybe Nvidia, um, again sometime down the road. I'm not convinced it's here, and you almost feel like embarrassed to say that because the hardest thing to do in this business is when you've had something that's worked for you know four, five, six months is to recognize it's at your target or it's hitting your target and a more prudent or cautious, even a tactical uh, approach is necessary. Yeah, well, listen, Chris, we appreciate it. Tactical is a term that we uh, have touched on a few occasions here. Really excited about your tactical ETF that you guys just launched. So good luck uh, with that. I appreciate you taking the time to break down some of the tenets of your career and uh, how things have moved along. And we really appreciate you being on the pod and coming on Fast Money all the time. So thank you so much for being here, Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah, a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. 